Tales from La Catedral, the Narco and the Reconfiguration of Prison Social Order in Colombia. So Manuel, we usually have 20, 30 minutes for your presentation and then for Q&A. Uh, thank you again for being here. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Maximo and Richard for having me here. Again, sorry for the delay and I, I hope I will spend less time than that. So let's get started. Um, well, I wrote this article uh, with a colleague and friend of mine, Libardo Ariza, uh, and as Maximo told you, uh, it's part of a book uh, that Maximo edited about uh, prison governance and inmates in Latin America. And in our article, uh, Libardo and, and myself, we wanted to concentrate on the impact uh, of the war on drugs uh, on Colombian prisons. I, I, I would say also in Latin American prisons, but uh, we'll make a, a particular emphasis on Colombian uh, prisons governance. So let's get started. Uh, we frame the article in this way. Uh, most of the literature on drug trafficking and prisons in Latin America uh, has focused in the last 20 to 30 years uh, in the impact of the world drugs on the increase of the prison population in Latin America. So of course, uh, the main methodology of research in this kind of studies has been based on quantitative data is to assess how the war on drugs has impacted Colombian and Latin American prisons, and particularly the prison population. So as you may see here, the most obvious impact of the war on drugs on Latin American prisons and the prisons governance is the huge increase of the prison population in Latin America and also in Colombia during the last three decades. So as a way of example, in the 90s, the average uh, imprisonment rate in Latin America was 126 inmates per 100,000 inhabitants, while in 2015 was 237. So as you can see, this has been a, a huge increase during the last decade, and which to a great degree, this is not the only cause or even the main cause, but uh, the impact of people in prison uh, for drug-related crimes in Latin American prisons uh, uh, increased this population. Uh, also, there are some peculiarities. For instance, uh, uh, as many, uh, many authors have suggested, uh, this has had a special impact on imprisoned women uh, who are disproportionately imprisoned for drug-related crimes. For instance, in Colombia during the last, at least during the last two decades, almost half of the female prison population imprisoned in Colombia uh, is imprisoned uh, for drug-related crimes. And this is also the trend in different uh, Latin American countries. Uh, nevertheless, uh, focusing on quantitative data uh, makes us lose sight of some other important effects or impacts of the war on drugs on the government on prisons. And here, uh, during the last years, there's been a very interesting develop development uh, regarding anthropological, sociological, and social legal studies who, who from a qualitative perspective, uh, through ethnographies, fieldwork, observation, interviews, have tried to assess and make sense of the effect of this punitive term uh, on the social order and governance of prisons. Uh, and of course, there's been an important reconfiguration or trans transformation of the prisons market social order uh, of Latin American prisons. Uh, this has to do with, uh, and these are topics that uh, are usually covered in this kind of research, First of all, as I told you, on the increase on the prison population, which has resulted in a structural overcrowding of Latin American and particularly Colombian prisons. For instance, in Colombia, during the last 10, 15 years, the average of overcrowding has been around 50% of the prison's capacity. And of course, as a consequence of this, a deterioration of living conditions in prisons and a loss of state control and legitimacy, which was already uh, very weak, but uh, under these uh, very harsh circumstances, uh, the legitimacy and the control of the state within uh, prisons has weakened in a significant way, which also has uh, resulted in the uh, strengthening and even the creation of prison gangs that rule and govern uh, the internal prison order, sometimes with the compliance uh, and even with uh, some, some kinds of agreements uh, with prison authorities as a way of uh, maintaining peace and order in prisons, even though under terrible conditions. Uh, 
And this also has resulted in the privatization of the provision of goods and services that the state ought to provide, but are actually provided by illegal markets, usually controlled and governed by prison gangs. Uh, also, which is very interesting and is covered in, in, in the book edited by Maximo, uh, actually, which, something which is very interesting to analyze, especially, for instance, in Brazil, uh, these conditions have resulted in the creation of prison gangs that were organized and created within prisons and that actually control uh, illegal activities, criminal uh, activities, not only within prison walls, but also on Latin American streets. Now, turning to the basic point of our article, uh, we wanted to assess the impact of a, a particular figure with, which emerged uh, with the war on drugs, with, uh, on drugs, which is the figure of the narco. The narco understood uh, not only as uh, uh, actual criminals or offenders, but also a, a very archetypical figure who has become uh, mythical uh, in Latin American popular culture as a very powerful baron, of course, always a male, with lots of power, capacity of violence, and uh, with uh, lots of attributes of virility uh, to uh, control their surroundings and with lots of forms of capital, uh, uh, social and economic capital. So what we wanted to do uh, with Libardo is to assess the instrumental and symbolic role in Latin American prisons, particular in Colombian prisons, of this figure of the narco uh, whose main characteristic or future is a person which, differently from prison gangs, concentrates a huge amount of power because he is the leader of drug cartels. And as I told you, this has become a, a figure, an important figure of Latin American popular culture. Uh, I would say that the most important examples uh, would be Pablo Escobar uh, in, the in the case of Colombia, leader of the cartel de Medellin, and Chapo Guzman, a leader of one of the Mexican cartels. Uh, and what we wanted to do from a qualitative perspective was to assess uh, something which uh, had a great impact in Colombia, which was the imprisonment, uh, if we can call it uh, like that, of Pablo Escobar in a Colombian prison, La Catedral. Uh, maybe you don't know uh, in detail Pablo Escobar history, also you can watch the series, the Netflix series Narcos, uh, which not coincidentally starts with the story of Pablo Escobar and, and the Medellin cartel. And part of the story is how he finally submitted uh, to the Colombian authorities, but not as a way of surrender, but as a way of negotiation through uh, uh, pressure and violence. Uh, so when he finally reached an agreement with the Colombian government, uh, he surrendered himself, but he actually achieved lots of benefits, starting with uh, granting in the Colombian constitution, which was enacted in 1991, uh, the ban of extradition of Colombians to different countries, particularly the United States, because this was the main concern of Pablo Escobar. So Pablo Escobar who had two main worries, being killed by his drug rivals, uh, the Cali cartel, or being extradited to the United States. So he obtained this constitutional guarantee that he would not be extradited, which was uh, his first condition. And the second condition that, that he could choose a prison of his own, La Catedral. And this is a very particular kind of prison which uh, Libardo and I argue starts like a new era in the Colombian prison system and which we think has been replicated to different degrees in different Latin American prisons, particularly in Mexico. Uh, so the story goes, and this is surrounded by a lot of myth, which is part of the symbolic power of the narco, that actually Escobar bought the grounds where uh, this prison was built, that he chose from uh, his henchmen and members of the uh, Medellin cartel, who would be the guards of the prison, and he actually had on his payroll uh, the military who were surrounding the prison to protect him from the attacks of potential rivals like the Cali cartel. So this can tell you the kind of power that a single person like Pablo Escobar uh, managed to have in Colombia during uh, the 90s, that he uh, actually, uh, as I said, he supposedly surrendered to the Colombian state, but maybe it was the other way around. <laughs> 
So how can we assess how Pablo Escobar and the figure of the narco transformed the prisons culture in Colombia and the governance of prisons? As I told you, as a form of expressing a, an extreme power, not only over uh, other inmates in the prison, but especially regarding the Colombian state. Um, so, as we argue in the article, uh, uh, Pablo Escobar and, and the st story, case story of La Catedral symbolizes the emergence of the narco ethos, uh, which would be uh, summarized in this catchphrase that Escobar used, which is in Spanish, plato plomo, money or lead, which means whether you accept my terms because I can pay you off or uh, you will be shot, and that's uh, the terms of the kind of agreements I'm willing to do with you. And also, uh, also, which I think it's very important in, in the government of prisons in Colombia, the narco aesthetics, which completely changed the prison dynamics uh, within prisons. And what we mean by narco aesthetics is a violent aesthetics of excess based on exaggeration and cell awareness, which even mocked the Colombian state. So uh, here are some pictures of, of La Catedral from the outside. So you can see that from the outside, it may look like a regular Latin American prison, very austere from the outside, but when uh, the scandal broke out in the Colombian press, uh, realizing that the conditions under on Escobar and his henchmen were detained were of a luxury, not even a luxury prison, but a luxury hotel for Colombian standards. You can, say, you can see here his living room, uh, Escobar's room, which uh, of course do not resemble at all a prison cell. Uh, and actually the, the scandal also broke out because uh, rumors uh, said that uh, Escobar continued commit, uh, committing crimes from prison and even uh, reached the excess of having people taken to, uh, to La Catedral and, and have them killed in the prison under the gaze of Colombian authorities, which did not, they didn't do anything about it. Uh, this also led to the reaction of the Colombian government, which, who was embarrassed by this journalistic scandal. And when we, they tried to transfer him to a different prison, uh, Escobar escaped, which was, he also had uh, a plan for escaping without shooting a single uh, shot. And he, he just escapes in, the, in front of the eyes of Colombian authorities. So one of the main features of, of the narco ethics and aesthetics uh, that changed uh, the governance of prisons in Colombia was this form of extreme power where the narco uh, controls the conditions under, under which he is detained and starts a new form of prison social order where it is clear for the authorities and the other inmates that actually he makes the rules, he does not submit to rules and he can do as he please and can live a luxury life, even if it's formally detained by the Colombian state, which also weakens the legitimacy and authority of the Colombian state. And actually, uh, this kind of excesses uh, are surrounded by myths. So you can hear uh, in Colombia, we listen all kinds of mythologies surrounding Escobar's imprisonment that were replicated by very serious journalists like uh, Escobar, uh, going shopping to a shopping mall in Bogotá, not in Medellín, but in Bogotá, which is at least 500 kilometers from Medellín with his family. Rumors also had it that uh, he was the owner of the main football squads in Medellín Nacional, and that every Sunday that his team played in Medellín, he left La Catedral to watch his team play football in the Medellín football stadium. Of course, these, were, these rumors were never confirmed, but were part of the mythology that confirms Escobar's huge, immense power. Um, we think this is interesting uh, to see how a, a single person who, can, who has this kind of economic, social capital that becomes a power within the prison uh, is actually an extreme, of course, it's a, an extreme example, but nonetheless, an extreme example of common features of Colombian and Latin American prisons, which uh, Elibardo and I uh, would summarize in two basic aspects, the porosity of Colombian and Latin American prisons and the hybridity of Colombian and Latin American prisons. And this is, I think this is very interesting in theoretical terms because uh, from this we can conclude that Latin American prisons are substantially different rather than a defective copy of the modern prison project coming from the global north. Uh, 
Uh, so according to the modern prison project, uh, prisons are considered total institutions where austerity and completeness are fundamental features of disciplinary power exercised by the state to control and the minds and bodies of inmates. And according to, usually to Global North literature that assesses Latin American prisons, uh, they consider that prisons uh, in Latin America or in the Global South are, as I told you, a defective copy of the modern prison project. Is Latin American prisons, because uh, we are undeveloped countries, uh, reproduce in a very defective way the modern prison project, which we try to uh, achieve in some way or the other. But I think the actual the point here is that, of course, without uh, we have to recognize that uh, the, the modern prison project arrived to Latin America in the second half of the, of the 19th century as a copy of the European and American model, but uh, underwent a transformation and adaptation process that converted Colombian uh, and Latin American prisons as an institution, as a completely different institution. And in this way, uh, we say that uh, Latin American prisons are essentially incomplete institutions with high levels of porosity and hybridity. What we understand by porosity and hybridity? First, porosity, also taking up on uh, literature on, of classic global North literature on prisons, uh, as total institutions, uh, prisons tend to isolate prisons from the external world and according to the degree of isolation of a prison from the external world, uh, they can have their own rules, their own dynamics, their own, their own forms of government, which are completely different from those of the outside world. And as I told you, this is a, a discussion or of degrees of porosity. Of course, authors of the Global North recognize that not the, not the ideal prison as a total institution never achieves a complete uh, closeness and autonomy, but has different degrees of porosity, meaning an openness to the external worlds that affects the dynamics and exchanges of prisons, social order and government and provision of goods and services. But the main feature in Latin America is the extreme porosity of prisons and their strict and extreme relationships to the outside world. And that was the case when the narcos arrived to uh, Colombian prisons, uh, meaning that uh, they were not only controlling uh, the government of prisons, but also still a uh, controlled uh, or had a huge amounts of power in the outside world through their criminal activities, political and social contacts. And they took all these privileges that they have outside to the internal prison order, like to create a new form of prison social order and new forms of government when uh, actually the narco was the figure that controlled prisons. And by hybridity, why we mean prisons as hybrid institutions. They're not just defective total institutions, but a different kind of institutions will configure a completely different social order, uh, which corresponds to the features of Latin American societies characterized by extreme forms of inequality and violence. So figures such as Enarco, uh, in even more extreme ways that prison gangs uh, exerted through violence, corruption and dissuasion, uh, government, uh, the government and control of prisons, even controlling and being the boss of prison authorities. So uh, again, uh, even though the narco may be an exceptional and extreme example, what it shows is that uh, given the conditions of the prisons, uh, of prisons social order in Latin America, where the state is with, uh, lacks legitimacy, is not able to provide the basic goods and services that the total institution should provide, the state recoils, recognizes, acknowledges the power of these groups, of these individuals, and let them govern prisons as a way of adapting to its lack of authority and legitimacy. And I'm going to conclude now. Uh, just a couple of more minutes. Uh, as a way of conclusion, we could say that uh, we can talk about a political economy of Colombian prisons under the ethics and aesthetics of the narco. 
uh, where the state rolls back most of its key functions, leaving them to the brutal competition of unregulated markets and power relations. Uh, and this also metastasized in Colombian prisons, in which ways uh, it became so naturalized, so ordinary to accept uh, this form of governments of prisons that uh, they translated also to different kinds of prisons. So in Colombia, we have all kinds of scandals regarding prisons, uh, government and social order, for instance, also with the military. Uh, so military in prison for committing serious crimes against humanity, war crimes, also because of their, of their power, govern the terms of their detention. So uh, there was a huge scandal in Colombia called uh, Tolemaida Resort, uh, which was a military base where uh, military prisoners were held uh, and where it was discovered by the press that they also did as they wanted. They could go out of prison whenever they wanted. They lived in very, uh, in very comfortable spaces. They transformed the spaces of the prison and they even developed different kinds of businesses within and outside prison walls. And you also can see that in the figures of powerful politicians detained under corruption charges that, again, it seemed like a huge advance in Colombia that finally corrupt politicians were detained and were in prison. But again, they controlled the prison social order where they were, where they were held and they had very comfortable conditions uh, of imprisonment and they could do as they please within prisons although they were formally imprisoned by the state. And just a final remark, uh, we think that this, this also mirrors the neoliberal political economy uh, of Latin America, particularly regarding the crime control fields where a fragmented state with a deficit of legitimacy displays a punitive and authoritarian right, which for example is reflected in the huge increase of imprisonment rates, but at the same time, uh, provide, uh, his lack of authority, legitimacy, uh, makes way for the creation of alternative social orders uh, under extreme conditions of violence and in in inequality where uh, under the force of capitalist market rules and dynamics, uh, the provision of services and goods that the state may not provide is provided by private individuals which colonize and control prison spaces. So uh, paradoxically, and I think this also reflects the neoliberal ethos and political economy, uh, we have a very authoritarian and punitive state, but that has no the means or even the interest to uh, provide some basic uh, goods and services and leave it, uh, leave, uh, it all to the private regulation in very extreme and violent ways of the market that provides those goods and services. Uh, and with this, I, I'm done. Thank you very much for your patience.